the bibliography attests to just how much in the news our topic now has been in probably, I'd say, the last two or three years, maybe a little bit more. There's been an explosion of interest in this topic of wokeism and its synonym or close synonym, cancel culture, at least many people think that the two things are very closely aligned. And all of that's linked partly to the debates and tensions that were surfacing in what David shared with us earlier. The clashes of rights, whether appeals to the common good and toleration are sufficient, or whether certain issues around race and gender and sex and disability and so forth are so urgent that those nice liberal concepts need to be set aside in something more driven by understandings of power, or as the discourse goes, hegemony. Well, we're going to explore all of that, but we're also going to put it within the framework of another contested area of rights and justice, which is, of course, religion. And it's with that in mind that I want to start with the etymology of this word woke or wokeism. It's fascinating to me as a fan of music, particularly popular music, that one could argue that the origins of the term woke lie in blues music in America, particularly the African-American vernacular that is expressed in blues music, which folk like Bruce Rosenberg and Nick Hamlin have said is inextricably bound up with black gospel music. The rhythms, the vernacular, the vocabulary of blues music as it emerged in the United States in the early decades of the 20th century uh, have strong resonance with the Negro spirituals that were sung in the cotton fields of the South, famously uh, in the era, era of slavery and beyond. And musicologists are very focused on the links between gospel music and blues music. And then later, R&B, what becomes R&B. And indeed, the first, uh, one of the very first recorded uses of the word woke, which is a kind of spin on being awake, is in the music of Leadbelly or Huddy Ledbetter, the blues singer, who was interestingly popularized in the 1960s by white folk singers who, who dug back into the origins of their music, which they saw in part being uh, in American blues and gospel. And in one of his songs, uh, Scottsboro Blues, he talks of being woke, of woke attitudes. Best to stay woke, he says. Scottsboro Boys is the song. Scottsboro Boys, not Scottsboro Blues, sorry. And that's a song about nine black teenagers who were accused of raping two white women. There were multiple appeals in the American judicial system that attended that particular case. And although they weren't ultimately resolved before some of those, uh, those defendants died, it's understood in the jurisprudence, the legal scholarship that's gone since, that there were serious, serious, serious miscarriages of justice uh, in that case. And indeed, that case was a, a driver towards the idea that when black defendants were on trial, it probably isn't a brilliant idea to have an all-white jury. So actually, in a music which owes quite a lot to Christian origins, uh, the word woke begins to have some significance and, interestingly, some socio-political significance rather than just sort of pietistic spiritual significance. Spool forward into the 60s and the novelist William Melvin Kelly, in a New York Times article, writes on this uptake of white folk singers, this appeal back to the black folk music of the earlier decades, and talks of the idea of being woke and digging it in the language of the time. It was cool, it was cutting edge to be woke to the links between 
black blues, blues music and white folk music. Um, and that's another fairly early use of the term. And then in 1971, Barry Beckham, a playwright, writes about the activist, the Jamaican activist, Marcus Garvey. And one of the uh, characters in the play says, Mr. Garvey done woke me up, which is, again, a reference to becoming politically conscious around issues of race and injustice. In the modern era, though, the conduit for the language of wokeness as being politically conscious is uh, initially popular music, uh, particularly Erica Bardu, her song Master Teacher, which is in some sense a more general expression of self-actualization and individual empowerment. It's not a particularly political song, but nonetheless, it is taken up uh, and kind of related to wider political issues. And she talks of there the importance of becoming woke, of being woke. And this is again uh, picked up uh, as we see in succeeding years and becomes quite, quite piquant and uh, intense as a self-identifying word. But I don't want to lose the biblical connection because whilst I'm going to be quite critical of aspects of wokeness in what I say, there are instincts, there are motivations that shouldn't be poo-pooed, I think, in this movement. Um, biblically, the metaphor of being awake, yes, is about being prayerfully awake to the movement of the Holy Spirit as a sort of individual and personal dynamic with God. But it also bears significant socio-political connotations, particularly in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament and in the apocalyptic literature of the New. So in the Psalms, awake my soul, says the psalmist in Psalm 57, 8. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. There is a sense that um, we need to be in touch with God. We need to be close to his word, to be awake in a spiritual sense rather than asleep to where God is leading. In Isaiah, that more prophetic sense of Israel returning from exile, rebuilding Jerusalem, needing to reestablish itself. Awake, awake, close yourself with strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days gone by. And that's not just about prayerfulness. It's about being conscious of the enemies of Israel who may yet again attack it as Babylon and Assyria did to cause it to be beleaguered and then be taken into, into exile. So there is a political connotation to the notion of wokeness, if you like, or awakeness in scripture. And then Revelation 16, 15, the voice of Jesus intervenes in the people of God's being again oppressed. Uh, the background, of course, is Nero's persecution of Christians in the mid uh, first century. And the voice of Jesus says, behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him. That's a metaphor for being not just clothed, obviously, but being clothed with the, with the power of God. There's an echo of what we read about in Ephesians 6 in terms of the armor of God, uh, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And then in revival movements in Christian history, which go back, of course, to uh, the, the early days of the church, but particularly in our modern history, are dated from the 1730s from figures like John Wesley and George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards in America, that, that reawakening of the vibrancy, the evangelistic zeal of the apostles, the need to take the gospel beyond the parish, beyond the local church, to the world, to all the nations, the Great Commission. The language of revival is often, again, synonymized, synonymized with the, the language of awakening. And in fact, in America, they talk about the first great awakening around Jonathan Edwards and then the second great awakening that followed in the 19th century. So this language is, is in the Christian tradition. Yes, woke is just a kind of past tense, adjectival use of it, uh, but it's, it's with some of those, those echoes. And I don't want you to lose that despite the critical uh, analysis I'm going to offer as we move through. But our main concern is where we are today. Wokeism as an ideology, if you like, or a philosophy or a worldview 
that is becoming ever more pervasive right now. In 2017, two leading dictionaries, the Oxford English Dictionary and Merriam-Webster, adopted the language of wokeness and wokery and wokeism uh, into their own texts. So to read how they define woke is to think it might be a fairly benign thing, you know, uncontentious. So in the OED, to be woke is to be alert to injustice in society, especially racism. Of course, a lot of that blues music was music bewailing the oppression of the black man and black woman in the United States. But it's not on the surface of that definition. And then Merriam-Webster talks about being self-aware, questioning the dominant paradigm, striving for something better. If you take those as face value, none of us in this room would want to kind of uh, push back against those concepts and values. They're of the essence, aren't they, of being Christian, that we should be questioning dominant paradigms, that we should be striving for something better. But as it's gained prominence, the adjectival use of the word woke to, you know, woke movements, woke philosophies, has become far, far more contested, as I say. In 2016, the co-founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, uh, appeared on television, or I think it was a a YouTube um, event, in which he wore this t-shirt, stay woke, hashtag stay woke. And at the time that was fairly exotic, nobody really quite knew what he was on about, and the interviewers are a bit perplexed. And he doesn't really help things, because in that interview, he says, woke is being aware and staying aware and keeping questioning. Again, who's going to gainsay that? That's fairly benign, isn't it? Fairly neutral. But the background of his wearing this T-shirt was something much more, much more incendiary. Um, It was the Ferguson disruptions in Missouri in America in 2014. The shooting of Michael Brown, black man, by Darren Wilson, a police officer in that context. And although Wilson was found innocent of murder, the upsurge of political sentiment And the division, and this is the key thing about wokeism, the division and the polarization that followed that was quite extraordinary. And just a year before, the movement Black Lives Matter had been founded, again in America by Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tomati, as a loose social media-based, internet-based movement to raise consciousness about racism. And their catalyst for that had been the killing of another black man uh, in 2013, Trayvon Martin. You might, some of you, remember that. But on its own website, in a statement of its values, Black Lives Matter didn't just confine itself to raising awareness about racism. It identified itself with neo-Marxist economics and cultural criticism, using the language of comrades, was a bit of a giveaway. And by cultural criticism, it was linking to French critical theory, which we'll revisit a little bit later, uh, but also uh, political ideas of the left. Disrupting the nuclear family was another value that it espoused, and also um, support for trans activism and queer theory. These were all in its statement of values around that time. And it rumbled along as one of the many movements that were provoking government to do more around these issues of racism and also of um, transgender and of uh, LGBTQ plus and so forth. But in the summer of 2020, it was the killing, the murder, as we must now say, of course, because there has been a trial that's established that, the murder of George Floyd. And you know, I don't need to tell you how much that further further fueled the fires of contention and debate around race and policing and all the rest of it. And out of that has come a greater focus on issues of whiteness and white fragility and unconscious bias in racism, so-called. Key books 
uh, that are part of that, of course, that movement, Areni Edo Lodges, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, and Robin D'Angelo's, and she's a white woman, interestingly, uh, book on white fragility, the tendency of white people, in her view, to be overly defensive when faced with accusations, particularly of implicit or unconscious bias around racism, even though they might protest not to be racist. Every bone of their body is non-racist, as people like Piers Morgan will say, and Nigel Farage will say uh, on the right in British politics. But the idea is that somewhere deep within your psyche, just because of your conditioning and education, uh, if you're white, you are, your, your default position will be implicit racist. And of course, there's been a massive amount of debate. I don't need to tell you as, as interns working with politicians uh, about those particular issues. Closely aligned with the concept of wokeism is the notion of cancel culture. Cancel culture is something which is to do not just with the assertion of one's own worldview and political position, it's the denouncing and marginalizing and shaming even, quite often, of those who disagree with a particular position. And it's that intolerance, as many would see it, that eschewing of the Lockean principle of toleration, which David so eloquently expounded earlier, that is causing so much division and polarization today. What we're looking at is, in a sense, a challenge to that liberal toleration-based consensus. On the grounds, as people like Robin D'Angelo and Edo Lodge would put it, that some things just should not be tolerated. Racism is not to be tolerated, it's to be opposed. So they speak in those books of anti-racism, intentional, motivated, political resistance against racism rather than just saying, I'm colorblind. This is the, the, the discourse of colorblindness, a naive view of equality that pervades those books. They talk much more readily of equity, namely achieving outcomes which are equal rather than the intention that everybody should be equal. And that goes to political activism it goes to the dissing, if you like, of less radicalized, less politically motivated understandings of race and gender and disability and the like. And it goes to the kind of tensions that we've seen today. Another major motor, of course, of wokeism as wokeism, rather than just being conscious or being awake in the old sense, is social media. The way that social media, particularly Twitter, with its very limited number of characters, encourages simplification, encourages sloganeering, encourages a, a sort of straight um, yes, no approaches to issues. I'm right, you're wrong. And that has fueled what we now call wokeism. But it's important to register that this is not just a black-white polarization. There are along with white commentators who will explore, there are black voices, voices from people of color, Asian and, uh, and other ethnic minority voices, which are also skeptical about where wokeism is heading. Barack Obama, in 2019, said in an interview, this idea of purity and you're never compromised, you're always politically woke, you should get over that stuff, said the first black president of the United States. Chloe Valdari, a writer and educationalist in 2020, said that wokeism is an aggressive, performative take on progressive politics that only makes things worse. And that notion of the word performative is important. The idea that you present yourself, that you display overtly your convictions, rather than just holding them as uh, internal motivations, and that you need to protest, you need to take direct action in some cases, is very much part of the woke agenda. Also, one of the most eloquent critics from the black community in America of wokeism is James McWhorter, um, John McWhorter, rather. He um, is a professor of linguistics at Columbia University. My first degree was in linguistics, and my 
My doctorate was linguistics and theology about theological language. So his work is really, really, I think, uh, on point in many ways. And he talks of woke racism, that there's a kind of inversion, there's a kind of um, reverse or inverted form of racism in the polarization of black and white that we find in books by people like Robin DiAngelo and Edo Lodge. He despises the cancellation that runs through some of the uh, woke activism that he sees around him. And as the subtitle of his book, Woke Racism, uh, indicates that uh, he believes it's a new religion. And he doesn't mean that in a positive sense. He means religion as in sectarian religion, which sees those who divert even a few inches from orthodoxy as enemies, as people to be, to be shunned and even prosecuted. There are, of course, uh, specific instances that have made the headlines in the last two or three years, which uh, you will be familiar with, I'm sure. People watching the video will have come across both uh, in the European context and the American context. Um, this is, I should say, um, not confined to, but particularly intense, this debate uh, in Britain and America, in uh, English-speaking Western contexts. It's there in, in Europe to, to a degree, and we are the European Leadership Forum, but I think it's fair to say, you may disagree with me, that the, the main kind of centers of contention are in Britain and America over this. So I'm choosing examples from those contexts. So Tony Sewell, very well respected educationalist, led a panel of, I think it was nine, uh, in authoring um, a report that the government oversaw for the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities uh, recently. And eight of the panel members were people of color. He, as you can see from the picture here, is himself black. That report was full spectrum in that it looked at indicators of deprivation that didn't just confine themselves to race. Um, it looked at economic disadvantage. What we'll later explore are the intersections between economic deprivation, education, class, um, and race. And he concluded that Britain was not nationally, institutionally, systematically racist across sort of all communities. Uh, there were definitely um, centers of racism in certain institutions, but not all. And in fact, as the report says, white working class boys perform less well even than black boys and black working class boys in school. And we mustn't make everything about the analysis of inequities and inequalities in society about race. I mean, that's simplifying madly. It's a very nuanced report. But there was what in the vernacular is called a pylon on the report from many woke activists who perhaps in some cases didn't read the whole thing, just problematizing it. That's another word you need to look out for. Problematizing means critically interrogating along the lines of these philosophical commitments that I'm talking about that go under the umbrella term woke. Um, and that came in for a, a heck of a lot of criticism despite the makeup of its panel members and what I believe is a fairly nuanced analysis. But because it didn't see racism as per pervasive going right through every level of society, every institution, it came in for a lot of, uh, lot of critique. Calvin Robinson is a former teacher and a worker in the technology industry who is an ordinary for the Church of England. And just recently, um, he had his curacy, his trainee ministerial post taken away from him in London uh, because he identifies right of center politically. He appears on GB News, which isn't quite the equivalent of Fox News in America, but it's sort of in that direction. Um, and he demanded the emails and letters under um, sort of public disclosure uh, legislation in this country, and uh, he believes that they reveal uh, sort of innate inbuilt bias against, um, against him. And he's very critical of uh, woke culture. He's unwoke in that sense, um, although, uh, of course, as an Anglican uh, ordinand, he would sign up to more biblical and theologically um, grounded traditional views of, uh, of racism and, and the like. 
J.K. Rowling, author of the Harry Potter novels. Well, again, you'll be aware of her defense of what are routinely called sex-based rights, the biologically defined understanding of what a woman is as an adult human female, okay, over against certain quarters of the trans activist community that argue otherwise, that it's possible for a man who was born a man, rather, to transition in various ways or even self-declare them to be a woman, themselves to be a woman, to be able to enter women-only spaces like in swimming pools, bathrooms, prisons, um, and shelters for uh, battered women um, without demur. Now, J.K. Rowling and others, Susanna Moore and, and others have, Jenny Murray, Jermaine Greer, push back against that, and we see the results. Again, social media um, pylons, uh, tremendous contention and polarization around her views, and the disowning of her, arguably, by members of the cast of the films made about Harry Potter um, that um, have uh, happened recently. Kathleen Stock, professor of philosophy at Sussex University, identifying again with that understanding of women and women's rights based on on sex, biological sex, um, hounded out. I don't think that's an exaggeration of her post at Sussex University by what I think in any regard, David will correct me if I'm wrong, could be regarded as harassment by students um, and uh, various, you know, through social media, but also on campus riots or, or protests and um, putting pressure on her both uh, on campus and, and at home as well. And she's, she's resigned her post. Jordan Peterson, the Canadian academic who stood up uh, against what he calls the compelled speech uh, in Canada, the legislation that would have regarded the misnaming of a trans person who claims a particular pronoun as a hate crime, as a form of hate speech, uh, has made his name, in a sense, out of that controversy as a commentator on wokeism. Jermaine Greer, I've already mentioned, uh, regarded as a heroine of feminism or a hero. One doesn't gender these terms these days if you're woke. So let's say um, uh, a champion of what is known as second wave feminism in uh, her book, The Female Eunuch, in the early 70s, now vilified because, again, of her uh, insistence on later work, like the whole woman, that a woman is an adult human female. Maya Fortastatter worked for a political think tank in the UK, um, and tweeted similar views to those of Greer and J.K. Rowling, lost her job and went through an employment tribunal that eventually on appeal exonerated her as having the right to express that view in a democratic society. Richard Dawkins, just to make sure it's not all about religious figures getting cancelled, um, interestingly, um, renowned atheist, obviously, you all know about Richard Dawkins. Well, he was deprived of a planned award uh, for being humanist of the year, because he wrote in a tweet this, some men choose to identify as women, and some women also choose to identify as men. You will be vilified if you deny that they literally are what they say they are. So arguably just a statement of fact, but it was inferred that he was non-woke, that he was pushing back against um, equality, and uh, therefore that award was withdrawn. Now, there are some fairly nuanced um, studies of cancel culture um, by folk uh, like Dan Kovalik. And um, Kovalik actually comes at this from a left liberal perspective. You know, I mentioned that Barack Obama and, and others who, who don't come from the right who are uh, mounting critiques of this. Um, and also uh, the legal scholar, uh, Alan Dershowitz, critique cancel culture for its censoriousness in fairly thorough studies, I'd say. Um, Eve Ng and Paul De Quincey have done pretty good work at looking at this from a balanced perspective. Um, and also, uh, you know, academics and leading thinkers banded together in Harper's Magazine to sign a letter in 2020 that, again, expressed deep concern about the divisions and polarizations that were taking place. And in some cases, the refusal of publishers to publish work by well-established authors that um, identified with the critique uh, of wokeism. So Margaret Atwood, although uh, hasn't encountered that particular cancellation of her work, has a, 
attracted a degree of opprobrium for identifying with those who would want to ask questions about wokeism. The author of The Handmaid's Tale, which, again, from the left, is a, is a pro-choice book. And if any of you have read The Handmaid's Tale, it's on curricula now in, in schools. Or you may have seen the, the film or the TV series, where it's clearly a, an a, apologetic for, for abortion. And yet she you know, is being cancelled by some folk um, uh, for her views. Now, it's important to be balanced. Uh, again, I've said that at the beginning around the um, theological and Christian origins in some degree of the idea of being awake and socially aware. It's important to be balanced. So, you know, there are voices who would say this is not a thing. It's concocted by conservatives. It's concocted by um, people who want a spat for their own party political and ideological ends on the right. Um, and we should just, just treat it as um, something that will be ephemeral and isn't to be taken seriously. So Sarah Huggy wrote in Time magazine in 2019, the problem is that cancel culture isn't real, at least not in the way people believe it is. Instead, it's, it's turned into a catch-all for when people in power face consequences for their actions or receive any type of criticism, something they're not used to, she wrote. So, so this is the whinging of people who have immense privilege already and aren't really being cancelled. So they would cite somebody like Margaret Atwood or J.K. Rowling, you know, um, <laughs> who are millionaires and um, who can continue to write blogs and still have plays put on in the West End. And, and they say, what's the issue? What's the issue? Haggy goes on to say, it all means that racist, sexist, and bigoted behavior or remarks don't fly like they used to. This applies not only to wealthy people or industry leaders, but anyone whose privilege has historically shielded them from public scrutiny. Because they can't handle this cultural shift. They rely on phrases like cancel culture to delegitimize the criticism. Shazia Mirza, a British Asian comedian with a Muslim background in The Guardian of all places, of course, not not a surprise, I suppose, in many people's minds. But in The Guardian, just a few months ago, wrote, people who want to say racist, sexist, homophobic, and transphobic things also want a license to say them. But then they get upset when people respond, that's racist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic. That's right. If you say bigoted things, that makes you a bigot. Now, the thing is, as we were saying in the earlier seminar with David, really the main question is who gets to define what's transphobic, bigoted? Who has the power in the discourse to say that you are a heretic, that you're out of line and you should be punished for it? That's the key question. It's a question that we're going to explore theologically as we move forward. I'd say that looking at this from a more theological angle, one of the key questions that sort of surrounds what we're discussing is the question of how universals relate to particulars. So tagging back to the human rights thinking we were doing earlier, as David said, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which purports to assert that there are innate, natural, and global rights. But as human rights legislation has spooled forward in the Equality Act in the UK 2010, it dawned on the legislators that there had to be certain groups within society who were accorded particular protections. Nine different groups uh, around age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, as it was uh, at that point, gay marriage, of course, also now, race, etc. And in some cases, it was legitimate to discriminate if you were in a protected group. So, in Christian schools in the UK, or in England particularly, it is legitimate to prioritize parents who will have been going to church more regularly. Vicars like me know the syndrome, where very motivated, often quite middle-class parents will move into the vicinity of a church school that is a very good, got good Ofsted results, good results for its performance, and they will find reasons to become very devout and pious for a two or three years before Jemima or, you know, Sebastian uh, are ready to come. Sorry, I'm stereotyping a bit. But, you know, are ready to go to school. Um, but it is legitimate 
for a church school, state-funded, state-supported, to discriminate. And that language of legitimate discrimination is, is used. So, so it's complex, because there are the rights of interest groups, and then there are global human rights. In our discourse right now, and sometimes the rights of particular interest groups are in tension, and we've begun to explore that, haven't we? Now, if we look at the history of Christianity, these needs to hold the universe and the particular together aren't fresh. They, they go back to the fact that, for example, Paul goes all over the Mediterranean, and he goes to quite different cultures, actually, where linguistic and traditional understandings of how things are done are different, and yet he goes with one gospel, one faith, one law, one baptism. One law, one faith, one baptism. But he contextualizes his mission to the particular context in which he finds himself. He is happy to play on his Roman citizenship when he and Silas are jailed in Philippi. They beat us publicly without trial, he says, even though we are Roman citizens. He talks of being all things to all people, that by any means he might win some. He claims his Jewish heritage really powerfully when he goes to Jerusalem. I'm a Jew, he says, with a Jewish audience, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city. He speaks of the church as being one body, the body of Christ, but with many limbs in 1 Corinthians 12. And of course, as the Christian tradition goes forward, it formulates what is there in Scripture, but is codified as the Trinity in which the one God of all the cosmos exists also as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this dialogue between global, universal principles and the particularities of creation go forward into the understanding of identity. And identity is also critical to the woke agenda and the woke discourse. Identity comes from the Latin word meaning the same or sameness. Identical, same root. So there's continuity, there's oneness, but there's also the reality, the lived reality, that our, dent our identity develops. We have a birth certificate, and I am the same person I was on my birth certificate on the 4th of January, 1964, when my mother gave birth to me. But of course, I've changed, I've developed, I've had different experiences. And the person I was when I got my first passport and then my driving license, same person, David Henry Hillborn, as on the birth certificate, but with that whole layering of experience and understanding that fed into my identity later. And that's not a surprise. There is development. There is progress in a Christian disciple's walk with Christ. We shouldn't be surprised at that notion. We are male and female, made in the image of God. And the Imago Dei is, of course, fundamental to human understanding in Christian uh, theology of uh, issues of justice and of community and society. But we, out of that same Genesis narrative, get the notion of marriage, whereby when a man and a woman, and of course, as an evangelical Christian, I want to say that's absolutely fundamental, and we'll come a little bit later to thinking about trans. But when a man and a woman are married, then the two become one. There is a development in their identity as a married couple. They remain the persons that they were, but they are brought together by God in a new community, a new sociality, which changes them because of their relationship to the other. Jesus talks also of single people in a radical way for his culture, where if you weren't married, you were ostracized, either through singleness or, or widowhood. He talks about eunuchs of different types, including eunuchs of the kingdom, people who have committed themselves to celibacy, and so does Paul do the same in 1 Corinthians 7. And then as our identity moves into the new heaven, new earth, in the language of the Bible, we are changed again. We are new creations in Christ when we come to Christ in conversion, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But we are 
brought together into a new community, which is on the march, on the chain, on, on the route to a whole new way of society being set up in the new heaven, the new Jerusalem. And as we're resurrected, so we're transformed in our body. Our resurrection bodies will not be, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, what our bodies are now. Now, some people take that as a pretext for suggesting that, for example, um, transgender reassignment and so on are fine because, you know, what we are now is not going to be what we are in the future. People like Robert Song and Adrian Thatcher around sexes, sex, debates about sex and gender. But that's what theologians call undue prolepsis. That's reading back something that is mysterious and still to be resolved under God's providence back into the present. For the present, it is, in my understanding, the male-female marital bond and the definition of sex and gender around um, that, those biological facts which uh, still are important for us to hold on to. But there is at least, in Christian understanding, the notion that universals in particular Facets are in relationship with each other. Now, let's land this in some practical examples, this tension that I've been talking about. Let's, let's take as our case study where a lot of this all began, namely the idea of race. But we'll read across to gender a little as well. Race is taken by most people, whether they're woke or not, to be one of the most immutable characteristics of human beings, defined principally by skin color, hence preferred terms black, brown, people of color. And evangelical theologians like Esau Macaulay would say that it is really important to understand the experience of a black person being different from that of a white person around things like policing in America. Very eloquent about this book, uh, reading while black, that I've put on the bibliography. Uh, around needing as a good, you know, good classical evangelical to understand that the experience of black people around stuff like that will be different. So there is a sense um, that one of the most immutable, fixed things in our identity would be our, our racial identity. And yet, interestingly, um, the woke agenda is often about people being able to move across different identities. The trans issue is a good example of that, that there is a performative quality to uh, being uh, of a particular identity. And tremendous row was emblazoned when Rachel Dolezal, perhaps you're aware of this, also known as Nkechi Amare Dialio, a US college instructor and activist, um, presented herself as black even though her parents were white and uh, she didn't start doing that until later in life. And it was only that she was outed as white by others that led her to um, accept that this had happened publicly. But she still held on to the idea that her race, and this tags in with quite a lot of the critical theory that underpins wokeism, that her race was a social construct. And as with trans women, it was possible for her to migrate from being white to being black. Now, isn't it interesting that that, that was deemed to be, by vast, the vast majority of wokest ideologues, to be unacceptable, to be a scandal? And yet, it turns out, and it's uh, similar to a case also that came up more recently in 2020 of Jessica Krug, an associate professor of history at George Washington University, who had presented herself in her work as black, a person of color, or as she described it, black mixed race, African and Puerto Rican, but she was also outed as somebody who was white and Jewish, interestingly. And a really thorough study by Rogers Brubaker, professor of sociology at the University of California, trans, gender and race in an age of unsettled identities, the key is in the word unsettled, says this, and it's really telling, and just listen carefully. Instead of the straightforward enlargement in the scope for choice and self-fashioning, we see a sharpened tension. Evident in everyday identity talk, public discourse, and even academic analysis, between the language of choice, autonomy, subjectivity, self-fashioning, and that of givenness, essence, objectivity, and nature, universals, if you like. 
Indeed, paradoxically, while sex is a biological category in a way that race isn't, sex and gender are understood to be more open to choice and change than our race and ethnicity. Do you get that? Actually, apart from skin pigment, biologically, there's far, far less distinction between a black person and a white person than there is between a male and a female, where every cell of the body is encoded. Every, every cell of the body pretty much is encoded for maleness or femaleness from the womb or early in a child's development. So there are paradoxes, there are tensions, there are apparent contradictions where this is concerned, but nonetheless, identity politics is massive. And one of the ways that the tensions between different identities have sought to be negotiated is around another concept which is key to wokeism, which is intersectionality. Intersectionality is an attempt not to ghettoize particular traits or characteristics of a human being, whether it be sex, race, gender, or whatever. It's an attempt to say that there is a relationship between one's sexual identity, one's race, one's economic status and education, disability, uh, and so forth. And one key voice in this is the legal scholar Kimberley Crenshaw, uh, who began in 1989 talking of the intersectionality, particularly of race and gender. And in an article published in that year, she investigated a case called Graffen Reed v. General Motors, in which she argued black women were made redundant more readily by General Motors in a particular round of redundancies, not because they were black alone, because there were white people who were similarly made redundant. Not because they were women alone, because there were in fact uh, men who were made redundant of a similar age, because it was an age-based redundancy policy, which brings in ageism and all the rest of it, but that's a slightly separate issue. But she said that the compounding of the fact that they were both black and women meant that they were discriminated against. There was an intersection of the two identities that wasn't taken account of. And in fact, um, the trials that followed couldn't find General Motors guilty because in Precedent at that time, one could only discriminate on grounds of one identity. And that's become a very influential paper around the idea that identity is complex and compound and that single issue campaigning doesn't go the whole way. And I think what I want to say theologically, as thinking theologians have done, <laughs> that the notion of intersectionality in and of itself is not a, a massive problem in that Jesus in his ministry and scripture more generally recognizes that intersections of poverty, for example, race and gender, do compound people's suffering and they compound injustices. So, so Ruth and Naomi go through the mill, one would say in a patriarchal society, in ancient Israel, where men tend to be the leaders, not because they're female alone, but because they're also poor. Think about the Samaritan woman in John 4. It's not just that she's a woman, she's regarded as down the hierarchy in that context, but also she's a Samaritan, she's a heretic. And Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, as he's claiming, is meeting her at a well and recognizing her marginalization. A Syrophoenician woman, who in the culture is regarded as a dog, something less than human, going back to David's point about Auschwitz and so forth. Jesus quotes, I would say, cites that language as a kind of test of her, how committed are you to me? You're coming from the margins. Do you really want to follow me? You're going to face a lot of difficulty. And she says, even the dogs gather the crumbs from under the master's table. And you know that's, that's an answer which is transformative for the going of the gospel to all the nations, to the Gentiles. He heals deaf mutes, he heals hemorrhaging women. Arguably, compound injustice is a thing in scripture. We have to be nuanced. Joe Carter writes very eloquently about this in our understanding of not everything in what's called wokeism being condemnatory. 
But there are issues, massive issues, which we need to address. Political correctness actually was a term that was banded around well before wokeism became mainstream. It has Marxist-Leninist origins in communist Russia, in Soviet Russia. Um, the idea of being politically correct was being aligned with the party under Lenin. The American New Left in the 1970s, Tony K. Bamara uses the term in a similar sense of being politically active and awakened. But it soon actually became a bit of a parodic term. Even the left used it as a kind of um, jibe against those who were super dogmatic in their own circles. And certainly from the 1980s, uh, from more right-leaning uh, thinkers like Alan Bloom and Dinesh D'Souza and Robert Kimball, it highlights intolerance and tension and division that was growing up in the left in academia in America. And they push back against that and critique that, particularly looking to so-called cultural Marxists like Antonio Gramsci for the idea that if revolution isn't possible in the Soviet Russian sense, then at least radicalization might be taken up in the institutions. And Rudy Dutschka, another Marxist, uses the phrase in the 60s, the long march through the institutions as a project that academics might be involved with. Now, there's a lot of contention around that notion of cultural Marxism. And I prefer to think of critical theory as being one of the key drivers of modern day wokeism rather than cultural Marxism, because that's just hedged around with so many complexities. So let's look at that in relation to another phrase that's often used uh, in this context, which is culture war. It's a phrase that James Davison Hunter used in a book in the early 90s, but also Pat Buchanan and then later Donald Trump from the right in American politics have talked about a war on the traditional family, a war on values that might be uh, associated with republicanism in the States and more conservative, um, one might argue, traditional Christian uh, outlooks uh, in Europe and Britain. It's also uh, used in relation to environmental activism, the arguments and debates that have surged up about green issues with Extinction Rebellion in Britain and, of course, BLM, and latterly now over abortion as Roe v. Wade in America. The federalization of abortion is being potentially repealed by the Supreme Court justices. But what fuels a lot of that contention and that tension philosophically is the movement often known under the umbrella term critical theory, which is again an interrogation of established understandings of truth, of sex and gender that comes from ultimately Nietzsche's critique of that Western notion of tolerance that we find in John Locke, but is picked up by theorists in France like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida in the late 60s, early 70s, who eschew the idea really of universals, who are skeptical about the ability of what they call a grand narrative to define values that will be held across cultures. And in queer theory, in the underpinning of the transactivism that I spoke about, and also uh, in the understanding of race, we see critical theory coming through. And this is a, a cluster of understandings which see truth as constructed in language, and language is forming the world. It goes back to the um, linguist Ferdinando Saussure, but his ideas are radicalized by Foucault and Jacques Derrida and Roland Barthes in the late 60s, and are picked up famously by Judith Butler in her book Gender Trouble from 1990. And she becomes the uh, major framer of ideology and philosophy around queer theory and trans rights. And what's critical to understand is that in second wave feminism, the feminism of Germaine Greer, the feminism of Julie Bindel, the feminism of J.K. Rowling, there's a distinction to be made between sex, which is biologically innate, and gender, which is constructed 
in discourse and behavior. So a woman is somebody born with XX chromosomes, basically. Um, sorry to be crude, but with certain genitalia and, and the ability to bear children, you know, biologically intrinsic traits. A man is born with other biology, XY chromosomes and all the rest, okay? So that's absolutely understood in second wave feminism, that feminism of the 60s and 70s, which gave rights to the Equal Pay Act and all other kind of legislation that equalized opportunity and outcomes for women. But in third wave feminism, there is um, a buying into critical theory and the idea that actually um, there's a category of gender that is uh, distinct from that, which is around the habits and the assumptions that we make, uh, giving dolls to, to girls when they're young, giving action men to boys. That's gender, okay? So that's, that was the understanding that pervaded second wave feminism and to some extent still is there in the iteration of that that moves into the 90s. But that then is radicalized and interrogated quite seriously by Judith Butler, and she becomes known as the hinge figure, really, between third wave feminism, the radicalization of the sex gender distinction, and fourth wave feminism, where in fact that's collapsed, that idea is collapsed. And sex is also socially constructed in discourse. Hence, I assert my identity, not I, but somebody might assert their identity as a trans woman, they might not even have to go through gender reassignment surgery to make them at least appear physically to be a woman. They can assert that. Their birth certificate can be changed. Their driving license can be changed. Their passport can be changed by the articulation in language of their identity. And Judith Butler becomes the philosophical uh, underpinner of a lot of that. So she says, when the constructed status of gender is theorized as radically independent of sex, gender itself becomes a free-floating artifice with the consequence that man and masculine might just as easily signify a female body as a male one and women and feminine a male body as easily as a female one. You see what's happening here. So we see a critique in queer theory of so-called heteronormativity, the idea that the baseline, the default, is a heterosexual relationship, male, female being distinct, uh, in the work of Lynn-Marie Tonstad and others, uh, that there is a... Um, a, a highlighting of previously marginalized groups as playing their role also. Judith Butler in a later article talks of when a midwife declares it's a boy when a child is born, she's performing a script or he's performing a script, midwives can be men, performing a script, a cultural script. Forget about the genitalia, forget about the biology. It's a drama that they're entering into. This is how radical the understanding of language form in the world can become. As I've said, Roland Barthes, in his understanding of language, talks of liberating what may be called an anti-theological activity, because he is fully aware that in this understanding of what language can do, reason, science, and law are problematized. And Jacques Derrida, in his work of deconstruction, as it's called, critiques what he calls a transcendental signif signified, a meaning beyond all meanings, a meta-narrative, a grand narrative <coughs> that explains the whole world. If you like, the narrative of human rights would be in that category, one would have thought. And this feeds into what David has been touching on, which is critical race theory, which assumes intersectionality um, as given, um, but is also indebted to critical theory, and it raises a lot of those questions, those paradoxes that Rogers Brubaker highlighted, which is that um, folk like Richard Delgado, Mary Marshall, Patricia Williams are prepared to say that race, whiteness, blackness are not just about skin pigment. They're about attitudes. They're about identity. They're about language. But you get a Rachel Dolezal or a Jessica Krug coming along performing as black, presenting as black, then you see what happens on Twitter. There is a hanging on to innateness where race is concerned, which is not quite what's happening in sort of leftist circles around sex and gender. So there are, there are real 
tensions here. What I want to do as I wrap up, because I do need to give the floor to you as we, um, as we move towards the end, I want to explore how we make sense of this theologically. There's a lot of Christian concern and critique around council culture and wokeness. Uh, Wes Carpenter, Owen Strachan, Joe Dallas, Stephen Strang have all written books recently, which I've uh, read with varying degrees of approval and uh, of uh, happiness as to the way they take things. Um, but they're very, very conscientized about this. There's a, a more, much more nuanced um, approach to this taken in Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, where he likens where Christians are at in this space to where they were in the second century. Remember, this is before Constantine, before Christianity became the approved religion of the Roman Empire, subject to persecution and subject to marginalization. He says, beliefs about sexuality and identity render Christianity immoral and inimical to the civic stability of society as now understood, at least in many circles. And we are likely very soon to run afoul of the authorities and even to be prosecuted and jailed for our previously classical understanding of evangelical ethics and morality. Rod Dreher, in his book, The Benedict Option, says, Christians who hold to the biblical teaching about sex and marriage have the same status in culture and increasingly in law as racists. Now, maybe that's slightly hyperbolic, but there are, I think, truths to be borne in mind in what he says. The Obergefell decision that he refers to earlier in the quote is the federalizing of gay marriage across the United States that happened in 2015. In our context in the UK, where I am, there's a lot of debate about banning conversion therapy, the government's intent to ban conversion therapy uh, as something which counsels uh, folk who struggle with same-sex identity, perhaps with religious motivation to stay celibate, to inhabit that because out of conviction they want to. Now, of course, there are practices that are already legal, like electroshock therapy and forced rape, of course, and uh, anything that's coerced that come under legislation around harassment. But in the way the legislation's been framed, there are, many people think, dangers that even consensual prayer and preaching texts in the traditional way around sex and marriage and relationships could be construed as a form of conversion therapy and subject be subject to prosecution. So how do we negotiate this? Let me just spool through a few further slides and then I'll turn it over to you. We've got till one o'clock. There are folk who want to see what's happening in our culture around these issues right now as a form of new Puritanism. Folk like... Um, Nigel Jones, in an article for The Critic magazine in 2021, or Anne Applebaum, in an article uh, in The Atlantic around the same time. And they cast the Puritans as dictating what people think, speak, and write, and make a parallel with wokeism. Now, I teach on Puritanism in my college context, and I can tell you it's much more complicated than that. There's another discourse which has seen Puritans as bearing out Paul's instruction, his, 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 his plea for freedom in Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery, but don't use, in verse 13, your freedom to indulge the flesh. Serve one another humbly in love. Balancing the assertion of individual freedom with communal responsibilities, to go back to David's dynamic. And Larry Seedentop sees that as being also birthed in Paul's negotiation of universalities and particularities, and as the, the champion of modern freedom in his book, Inventing the Individual. Belief in Christ makes possible the emergence of a primary role shared equally by all, he says, in Paul's mission. And that commitment cut up against, of course, the power, the hegemony of the Roman Empire, hence persecution under the mission and Trajan and others uh, in those early centuries. 
But also with Constantine comes the paradox of a state-regulated religious freedom in which sanctioned movements are free and other movements are not if they step out of the creedal orthodoxy imposed by the state in imperial mission. And many strands of the Catholic and Protestant churches held on to that link between the church and the state, and that, in one understanding, is what led to those wars of religion that we spoke about in the 17th century. And it's coming out of that contention that we see the ideas of many Puritans, particularly separatist Puritans, who were so trammeled by the state, imposing a particular form of Christianity on them, that they fled to Holland from Britain. They fled to the United States, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, because they were seeking freedom. So, so the idea of New Puritanism is complex. And in the work of Cecil Northcott and John Van Til and Michael Farris and others, they show that in many ways, Puritans were the progenitors of modern democracy. They gave rise to toleration as both institutional. I'll not dig into Van Til's analysis of that conscience as an individual facet. They fed into John Locke's letter concerning toleration. Whatsoever things are left free by law in the common occasions of life, let them remain free unto every church in divine worship. They fed into the First Amer Amendment, to the American Constitution, protecting freedom of different religious groups to express themselves in the public square. They fed into J.S. Mill's notion that that assertion of freedom is fine unless and until someone asserts their freedom such that others are harmed. And that would typically be understood physically. Words in Mill's analysis, unless they incite riots and violence and murder, are not to be seen on the same level as um, harm to one's person, one's bodily person. And that's another big debate. The idea in wokeism of language not only forming the world but actually terrorizing people and being innately violent when used by people of the wrong philosophy or ideology. Silence is violence. So it's both if you use the wrong language but if you fail to use the right language, you're complicit with violence and harm. This is not Mill's understanding of harm. David maybe want to pitch in on this in the Q&A. This is not Mill's understanding of harm. It's a, an intensifying of victimhood. Hence, in America, Jordan Peterson coming under scrutiny for his opposition to Bill C-16, the bill that was going to construe misgendering folk as a hate crime. So the universal language of human rights in this space is under some pressure, as we explored in Seminar 1 and we're now thinking through here. As Christians, yes, it's important that we claim our right to proclaim the gospel in an orthodox way that may cut up against a lot of wokest ideology, as I've sort of expounded it. But we also have to have humility and compassion and empathy. We need to understand where people are coming from, even if where they end up politically is not aligned with the gospel. John Stott, in his book, Issues Facing Christian Today, points out what we would actually saying earlier, which was that Jesus became a prisoner of conscience. He didn't assert his human rights at the end. He was falsely accused, unjustly condemned, brutally tortured and crucified, but he declined to defend on demand his right and he self-sacrificed that he might serve others. This is the verse 13 element of Galatians 5. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. And I'm going to turn over to you now some thinking about where aspects of wokeism converge with Christian motivations and where they diverge. Now, have I got this right? You tell me. This is now the over to you moment. Regard for others and neighbors, those who are different from us, runs right through not only actually the Old Testament in its concern for the, the alien and the stranger, in sanctuary for them, but also in the new, of course. It stems from the fact that all are made male and female in the image of God. It stems from Jesus' golden rule that we must treat others 
as we would expect them to treat us. Paul's injunction to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The Southern Baptist Convention recently issued a statement on critical race theory and intersectionality. And it said that they should only be employed as tools subordinate to Scripture. Scripture must determine how we understand justice. But they say that while we denounce the use of critical race theory and intersectionality to divide people, we don't deny that ethnic, gender, and cultural distinctions exist and are a gift from God. We have regard for the weak and the dispossessed, as Jesus did in his Nazareth Manifesto in Luke 4. We have humility towards the other. In 2 Philippians 2, Paul talks about regarding others as better than ourselves, of being generous in our construal of what they say. There is a rejection of injustice in Scripture. In Isaiah 58, the fast that God expects is to break the bounds of, or the bonds of uh, oppression. Let justice roll down like rivers, says Amos. Jesus again citing Isaiah 61 on justice for the poor and the dispossessed and the prisoner. There's a rejection of racism. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. Galatians 3.28. Ephesians 2, Jesus breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. There's a an Ethiopian who becomes one of the first evangelists in Acts 8, a person of color. And there is also a need to say, this is acceptable in our community and this isn't. In Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5, 6, there's a church discipline which says, yes, some people will not accord with our theological understanding and it's right that they be asked to leave or be excommunicated as the language would come later. There are limits to orthodoxy. There are limits to sound doctrine in Scripture. And Paul also talks about that, of course, in his correspondence with Timothy. So there are some convergences, but there are divergences, I want to say. There's a difference between being judgmental and having good judgment. Jesus speaks, doesn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount about the speck in somebody else's eye and the log in our own. Having a humble understanding of how we judge others and, if you like, um, cancel them. But the spiritual person judges or discerns all things, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.15. And that's important also, to say this is right and this is wrong. A lot of the problem with wokeism is that it's anthropocentric. It's given up a God-shaped understanding of the world. It's the result, as critical theory is, of actually quite militant atheism at times. And without God reconciling these differences, bringing people together under his sovereign grace, there are going to be cancellations that are ungodly. There's going to be a kind of um, talking up of going away from a particular group's orthodoxy as really sort of major. Microaggressions is a language that is used when people step out of line linguistically quite often, often without intent. And we have to make a distinction perhaps between mistakes and sins in that respect. Although, you know, we can come back to that. There's a difference between objectively being harmed by somebody, being punched in the face, and being insulted by something they've said about your ideology. I, I think we, we need to register that. And there's a difference between safetyism, which is the ideology of always needing to be comfortable and safe around what people say about us, which Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff interrogate in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, and resilience, the resilience that Jesus had as he went to the cross, and he called people to have as they walk the steep, steep and narrow, narrow path, as he puts it, that leads to life. The comedian Jeff Norcott was asked recently, isn't wokeism just a word made up by the right to uh, own the libs, was the phrase, to own the liberals, you know, like to, to diss the liberals. He says in the discourse, the interviewer, oh, it's just concocted. It's a recent term that's been invented out of thin air. He said that, yeah, the thing is that sanctimony, the origin of that word, is about 1611. And that's been around for centuries, and it amounts to the same thing. 
right? Sanctimony is kind of uh, overly pietistic view of one's own holiness over against others. There's genuine holiness rooted in empathy and compassion, and then there's sanctimony.